Welcome. I'm Robert, Principal Developer Advocate for Amazon Web Services. And this is an introduction to GraphQL. Let's go over the agenda. I'll begin by covering what GraphQL is by way of demo. I'll talk about the history of GraphQL and how we got here. Everyone's favorite, we have to compare GraphQL to REST. And then I'm going to talk about the three superpowers of GraphQL. We'll go a little bit deeper into authentication and authorization, as these are two extremely common follow-up questions once people get started with GraphQL. And then we're going to zoom out and talk about when you want to use GraphQL, and more importantly, how to take it into production. So first, what's GraphQL? Well, rather than giving you an explanation or a definition, let me show you. Let's learn GraphQL by doing a simple exercise. We want to fetch the names of all Star Wars characters that appeared in films with Luke Skywalker. We're going to do that by using one of these two APIs, the REST API and the GraphQL API. Both of these have the exact same data behind them. They're just organized as either the REST architectural style or in the graph via GraphQL. Let's start with the REST API. If I click and open this first link in a new tab, I get taken to the URI slash people slash one, and this resource represents Luke Skywalker. The browser here is doing some formatting to make JSON a little bit more readable for me. And I see that Luke Skywalker has other properties associated with him, height, mass, hair color, Notice that height and mass are both numbers, but they're expressed as strings by virtue of these double quotes here. And let's also notice that there are a couple of related resources that are not expressed in line here. They're actually expressed as hypermedia links, for example, homeworld, films, species, etc. Films is what we want. The exercise asks for the names of all the characters that appeared in other films. So it seems reasonable that I would go and click through these films. But before I do that, let's try and guess what properties this film is going to have. Actually, we need more than a guess, because if we're going to write code against this, we need to know. But without actually opening this hypermedia link, how would I know? For example, we didn't know that height and mass were strings instead of numbers. Similarly with REST, in general, there's no way to know the structure and the type of the document that you're about to fetch without having some sort of out-of-band documentation. But let's click through to one of these films, and we can see that this film contains opening crawl, all the titles, uh, all, the, all the characters, planets, starships, etc. Now, for this exercise, this is the only array we need. We just need the characters. But when I made the request for API slash film slash three, all this other data came along, like this opening crawl and all these other arrays. It's a little wasteful that I'm not going to be using any of that data. This is a problem called overfetching, and we're going to revisit this later on in the talk. Now, for each of these characters, they're again hypermedia links, and chances are they're going to look a lot like the Luke Skywalker character that we saw. Yes, indeed, they have height, mass, and I can just pick out the name. Again, this character comes with a whole bunch of data that I don't need. All I really need is the name. However, knowing all that now, it's just a few lines of code to implement this. Let's take a look at that real quick and open up browser inspector, and we can see that this function here, run rest, does exactly what I just described. We start with the Luke Skywalker URI, we fetch this object, and we await the response, and then I just have this helper function here called fetch all, and what I'm going to do is fetch all of the films from the character.films field. <clears throat> I'm going to flatten them, filter out uh, unique values, and then for each unique character, I'm going to fetch all their names, and then I'm, I'm just going to do a little bit of munging, and then I have the data that I need. That's it. Pretty simple. So let's move on and see what this looks like in the GraphQL API. So if I click this GraphQL link, I get taken to GraphQL Playground. GraphQL Playground is one of the GraphQL IDEs. Now on the left-hand side, I can author my GraphQL query, and when I press the Play button, I send that query to the server, and the server will return with a response. What kind of query can I write? In order to figure that out, I can open up the schema tab on the right, and it shows me all of the data that this GraphQL API supports. 
And if I scroll down to person, I can see that, oops, scroll past it. I can see that this is the type person and these are the fields on the type of person. And then these are also the types of those fields. So all of these are strings. Remember, we've tried to keep the data as intact as possible. And then for Homeworld, look at this. Instead of a URI, we get Homeworld is a planet. Okay, now what this means is that I should be able to come in here and find the root query. So this is something that I look for called type query. And this is gonna represent all of the entry points into my GraphQL graph. Um, I can start off my query by trying to access any one or multiple of these fields. I'm just gonna start doing that and you will see what it looks like. So what I want is person with name, because I remember I need to start with Luke Skywalker. And then from Luke, I can actually pick into other fields. So I know that Luke is of type person. Actually, let's just play back the name, make sure that we're getting Luke Skywalker. Great. All we're doing here is saying, hey, get the person named Luke Skywalker and give me the name. Seems like a bit of a redundant exercise, but it's a great sanity check. Now, what other fields can I pick off of person? Well, it turns out that I can pick films. And if I pick films, then I can also look for the film type here. What can I pick out of films? Well, let's just get the title for now. Okay, so now I have the titles of all the films that Luke appeared in. I don't want title, I want characters. And then what did I want from each character? I wanted the name. And just like that, I have the names of all of the characters that appeared in films with Luke Skywalker. Let's contrast this with the REST API for a moment. I have a single round trip network request and it captures the exact data that I need, no more, no less. This is why when you run, I'm gonna run this a few times just to get the good baseline here. This is why when you run these benchmarks for fetching with REST and fetching with GraphQL, why GraphQL is so much faster. Because if you look at the network tab, If I run with REST, look at all these network requests. This is nearly 100 network requests that I need to make in order to fetch all the characters with Luke Skywalker. But if I come back in here and I do fetch with GraphQL, it's only a single network round trip. And while there's gonna be some variance, in general, the performance of a single network request is gonna be much, much better than multiple network requests. So that's GraphQL. Back over to the slides. All right. Now that you've seen that demo, we're prepared to answer the question, what is GraphQL? Well, what you saw in that demo was that we had a GraphQL document. We sent that over to the server in the form of a request and the server responded with JSON. Okay, but there's a little more to it. We saw that when we wrote that request, there were certain grammatical rules to how that document was shaped. And that is specified by the GraphQL language specification. And these are common sense rules like pairs of curly braces need to match. But then we also saw that the document consisted of certain fields and relations that we selected into that were domain specific and defined by the schema. And finally, of course, we had a server where we sent the actual request and a server that did the computation, that did the validation, and did the parsing and responded with a response. And that's what you saw in a nutshell. It's a couple of pieces and they work together to form that demo that you just saw. It's also instructive to understand what GraphQL is not. Now, oftentimes you have client applications that need to perform some sort of client-side state management to provide caching or cross-page consistency or optimistic updates. GraphQL is none of those things. It is not a client-side state management solution, so it is not going to be re to replace things like Redux 
or relay. And GraphQL was also not built for binary streams. By binary streams, I mean things like file transfers, servers, uh, uh, sorry, uh, images, streaming video. You can do some of these things. For example, with images, uh, you can base 64 encode smaller images. You can perform file transfers. It's just that GraphQL was not designed for binary streams. And there are certainly APIs that are optimized for those kinds of things. A lot of people also confuse GraphQL for the Facebook Graph API. Uh, the names are pretty similar, but the Facebook Graph API is Facebook's third-party REST API for developing Facebook applications, whereas GraphQL, at least at Facebook, is the first-party API. Now, that is, Facebook uh, only uses GraphQL to power its, its first-party applications, its uh, Facebook mobile applications, its web applications, et cetera. And GraphQL also isn't limited to any specific database. In fact, it has very few restrictions on the back end. Uh, you, it's a very thin layer, as I think you'll see later in the stack diagram. Uh, you can use it with all sorts of backends, uh, whether it's uh, something like an in-memory cache or whether it's a relational store or a non-relational store. And that's because the actual mechanics of the GraphQL server, those fields that you selected into in the document, those are all just functions. And the function can do anything. It can calculate a value on the fly. It can read it from a persisted backend. Um, it can call into another service, whatever you want. And speaking of the backend, it's not limited to the JavaScript ecosystem. Uh, now, this point of confusion comes from the fact that the GraphQL reference implementation is written for Node.js. But there are actually many mature implementations of GraphQL servers uh, in many different popular languages, including Java and Python and Ruby and C Sharp, Rust, Go, you name it. Um, and many of these services are used in production at scale across a variety of different companies. On the front end, you are not restricted to any specific front end technology or any front end technology at all. In fact, uh, one of my favorite examples is that you can use GraphQL to build a command line application, for example, a PowerShell script. Um, but again, if you do use it to build web applications, you don't have to use it re with React. People like to combine React and GraphQL and Relay. Wow, those are, that's a very powerful combination. That is by no means a requirement. You can use it with plain old jQuery if you want, or you can just use it with XML HTTP request. And at the transport layer, it's not limited to just HTTP. Again, we see a lot of these API technologies piggybacking on top of HTTP because HTTP is ubiquitous. But uh, uh, HTTP is just one of many transports. You can also use it on the back end for server-to-server -server communication, which doesn't happen over HTTP. Uh, and moreover, if you want to use the GraphQL subscription operation, regular old HTTP 1.2 isn't even enough because uh, that's not able to express um, long-lived stateful connections. Speaking of GraphQL operations, let's go over them real quick. There are three GraphQL operations. The first is the query, and the query conceptually models a read where the client sends a request to the server and the server responds with a single response. The mutation models a write, where again, the client sends a request to the server and the server responds with a single response. Finally, we have the subscription. And the subscription models event observation. The client specifies a GraphQL document that is to be re-executed whenever a particular event occurs and the response of that execution is pushed back to the client across a persisted connection. Now, queries and mutations are stateless, and they can operate over any transport that requests that supports the request response model. However, subscriptions are stateful, and that requires extra consideration when you want to maintain non-functional requirements like durability and availability and throughput at scale. Another thing is that queries and mutations only semantically represent reads and writes. What I mean is you could write a query that ends up mutating the server state, and you could write a mutation that doesn't mutate anything, just like you can write uh, an HTTP get operation that, that deletes a row in a database, or you could write an HTTP post operation that actually performs a read. Right? These are nothing more than semantic uh, declarations to help communicate the intent 
of the API designer. And moreover, a GraphQL server doesn't have to support all these operations. If you don't want to support subscriptions, then you simply omit it from the schema. Let's put that query under a microscope and see what's going on. Inside this slide here, we have a bunch of text, and this is the query text. Now, this whole thing is called the GraphQL document. And as we saw earlier, we can send one of these to the server, and if everything goes well, then the server will spawn with JSON. When the server receives this document, the first thing it will do is parse and validate it. If it's not valid, the server, uh, if it is valid, then the server will attempt to execute it. But if, for example, you're missing something like a curly brace, this is simply not a syntactically valid GraphQL document. The server can detect that, and it will not execute an invalid document. Now, within the GraphQL document, the query, uh, what I've highlighted here is the operation type. And this is one of those three operations that I mentioned a couple slides ago, the query mutation or the subscription. That is usually the first keyword that you see in the GraphQL document. Next, we have the operation name. Now, this in some cases is optional, especially for the query. But the operation name is extremely useful for debugging, for documentation, and for identifying which operation failed in the event that you send multiple GraphQL documents to the server at the same time. Highlighted here is a variable. And what variables can do for you in GraphQL is to make your GraphQL documents more reusable. In this case, by pulling out ID as a variable, we can now fetch any author so long as we know their ID. And you can see that right after the operation name, we are declaring the variable. We're saying its name is ID, and it is of type ID. And that bang means, again, that this is not nullable. This must be provided. And then further on in the document, you can then reference ID from your various resolvers. Here, we've highlighted the query's selection set. And it's designated by the outermost set of opening and closing curly braces. Within the selection set, we have a set of top level fields that are called root fields. You can think of root fields as entry points into the graph of data that this particular schema provides. And when we go into the selection set a little bit deeper, we can see that for a linked entity like a book, which is not a scalar field, but rather it's a relationship to a different object type within the schema, you can offer a subselection. Now, one of the interesting things about GraphQL is that if you visualize the entire query as a tree, all of the leaves of that tree must terminate in scalar fields. Scalar fields are things like int, string, bool. In other words, you can't stop at something like a book. Uh, this is If you stopped here, if we deleted that, that highlighted segment, this would actually not be a valid GraphQL document. You must keep selecting until you reach all scalar fields in your query. All right. GraphQL has a pretty interesting history, and I'm going to take you through it real quick. The first version of GraphQL was built internally at Facebook back in 2012. And if you recall, I know 2012 seems like forever ago, but at the time, Facebook was in a bit of an identity crisis. Uh, it was trying to figure out how to really succeed in mobile. And uh, what it learned was that uh, the REST architectural style was simply not cutting it. Um, they needed something totally different to serve the data fetching needs of their mobile applications. And so from 2012 to 2015, Facebook built and used GraphQL internally. And then in 2015, uh, they open sourced GraphQL in two parts. The first is the language specification, which again are the domain agnostic rules, the grammar of GraphQL. And then they also open sourced a reference implementation that is the Node.js reference implementation. Now today, uh, GraphQL powers many things, uh, obviously most notably the Facebook mobile and web applications. But since then, since GraphQL has been open sourced, 
Many other companies have adopted GraphQL usage. Uh, we use it here at AWS. Um, we use it across various other services and products at Amazon. Many other companies, uh, GitHub uses it, um, uh, New York Times uses it, uh, lots of different companies, lots of different services. But GraphQL has grown so quickly and so far since it was open sourced in 2015. And in 2018, we saw the announcement of the GraphQL Foundation. Now, I mentioned that from 2015 onward, we saw a lot of GraphQL adoption. And a lot of those people who adopted GraphQL said, hey, hold on a second. GraphQL seems to be primarily controlled by Facebook. Well, you know, maybe we're Facebook competitors, or maybe we're concerned about the governance of the evolution of GraphQL as a language. Um, if you think about the analogy of SQL, it's difficult to imagine that uh, uh, we could have such a vibrant ecosystem around SQL were it not for the neutral governance of the specification of that language itself, right? And so with GraphQL, there was a, a, a lot of natural demand for neutral governance of the project and all of its associated uh, um, supporting pieces. And so the GraphQL Foundation was announced, and I'm really happy to also share that uh, AWS was a founding member of the GraphQL Foundation. We were there since day one, and we continue to be part of the GraphQL Foundation, uh, and we're really excited to support this project and to support the, the vibrance of the ecosystem uh, well into the future to make sure that GraphQL is, is, remains a healthy and vibrant open source project that everyone can use. All right, uh, this, is, this is everyone's favorite part of this talk, GraphQL versus REST, because a lot of people, they, they, uh, you know, this is a debate that happens you know, at, the, at the water cooler over a coffee, um, and I'm sure uh, you know, friends have become enemies, enemies have become friends over this debate. It's very fun. Um, but, but, you know, uh, the reason why people always pick on REST versus GraphQL, let, let's talk about that first. Why, why REST versus GraphQL or why GraphQL, GraphQL versus REST instead of GraphQL versus one, any one of these many, many other API technologies. And the reason is simple. It's because REST is ubiquitous. REST is the architectural style of the web. There's been no more successful API uh, uh, style uh, ever. Um, nothing has... has uh, gone the length of rest because nothing is at, else is at the, tr at the scale of the internet, right? And so uh, my hope is that by comparing rest with GraphQL, you can transitively understand how GraphQL would compare to uh, any, others, any of these other APAC technologies such as SOAP, gRPC, Thrift, OData, whatever. So before we go in, uh, I, I do want to preface that uh, You'll find a lot of literature online that talks about how GraphQL is going to replace REST and, and REST is dead. Uh, that, that kind of narrative is uh, overzealous. It's probably fishing for clicks. Um, so I want to frame this competition, uh, this comparison in terms of trade-offs. Uh, please avoid trying to think of each of these columns as a checkbox uh, where you know, the, most checks in, <laughs> the most checks wins. Uh, Rather, really think about what I'm saying with each of these comparisons. In some cases, it's not a one is better than the other. It just happens to be different. Um, so starting off, uh, imagine that you are in a room with a bunch of other developers. And uh, everybody says, hey, I built a REST API. What are the chances that you can work with those developers and use their REST API without talking to the person? How would you do that? Let's say they gave you the URL for the REST API. Can you use that API without ever talking to the developer who wrote it? Think about that for a moment, really. And then think about if somebody gave you a GraphQL endpoint, could you use the GraphQL endpoint without talking to the developer? I think the answer in general is, Yes, you can use the GraphQL endpoint, and no, you cannot use the, the REST endpoint. Why? It's very simple. It's actually because REST is not a specification. REST is an architectural style. In particular, it's a set of six architectural constraints. These are things that the API must or must not do. And a style is not specific. It's not a, it's not a reference implementation. Whereas GraphQL has a concrete definition. It's not up for debate. Right? Everybody likes to talk about, hey, is this a REST API, or is this just a hypermedia API, or is this a JSON API? Or you know, maybe you think that a REST API 
is uh, strictly defined by the Richardson maturity model. Whereas I think it's an API that is, you know, has to use uh, the hypermedia constraint. We, we can have a lot of fun debates about what REST is, but we cannot have those debates about GraphQL because GraphQL is both a specification and a reference implementation. And so GraphQL has a, has a very, very strict definition. What, what is GraphQL to me is GraphQL to you, and therefore you can use my GraphQL API without ever having to talk to me. The next difference is the conceptual model between REST and GraphQL. Uh, in REST, uh, the central organizing concept is that of the resource. Now, you can think of a resource as kind of a virtual file. Um, but in GraphQL, the central organizing concept is a graph. That is, nodes with fields and relationships to other nodes. And while you might say, hey, hold on a second, but REST resources have hypermedia links to other resources, and isn't that a graph? And the answer is absolutely, yes, that is also a graph. But even that subtle difference of what is the central, where, where did that concept start? Is it the resource or is it the graph? Even that has differences later on in terms of how you add features to your API. For example, in REST, you end up with a proliferation of different URIs, whereas with a GraphQL endpoint, you access the same URI, you change the parameters of the, the requested document. Uh, so you can see that even something like this can, can have profound differences later on in terms of how you uh, operate your API at scale. Next, there, REST and GraphQL have different approaches to organization. Um, so with REST, uh, you have a decentralized federated model. And by federation, I mean you can link resources between different domains very easily. For example, I can make a Facebook post and in that post, I can include a link to Wikipedia. And then in that Wikipedia article, there might be another link to New York Times. Uh, whereas in GraphQL, if you want to link data across multiple different schemas, uh, there, that's a challenge. And that's something that a lot of different projects have made significant progress in over the last few years. But I would say that overall, GraphQL, when you think about a single GraphQL schema, it is a set of, of types and relationships that are internally consistent. And as a snapshot, any given snapshot of that schema is internally consistent. Whereas imagine if you were to try to write a schema for the entire web, that's not going to be possible. REST has a concept known as manipulation through resource representation. This is one of the REST architectural constraints. And it means that basically a uh, any given resource includes hypermedia links that can be used to describe how to manipulate the resource. For example, uh, you might get a JSON document and it includes links that, inc that say uh, this link, by following this link, you would delete this resource. By following this link, you would replace the resource, et cetera. Uh, in GraphQL, there's no equivalent. Um, if you're at a particular node in GraphQL, there's no such thing as a related operations where you can say, hey, what are all the mutations that can change this resource uh, or can change this, this document um, or mutate it or, or what are all the queries that can query it? GraphQL does have something else called introspection. And uh, introspection is kind of like reflection for your API. It's a core feature that enables us to build tools like the GraphQL IDE. But it's also the same feature that allows you to generate type-safe client-side code, as well as many other integrations. Uh, by contrast, it's difficult to see how you would have introspection for REST. Again, because REST is a set of architectural styles. You do have certain frameworks, um, uh, like, like um, Swagger, for example, that can generate uh, what is effectively a map for your REST API. But that's Swagger is not REST. That's just one specific set of frameworks and tools, right? So that's why I say uh, uh, introspection, not available in REST, but it is available in GraphQL. And because of introspection and because of the schema, GraphQL offers strongly typed inputs and outputs. Uh, REST simply does not. And lastly, these uh, REST APIs and GraphQL APIs differ in terms of their approach for real time. Uh, because of the statelessness, the stateless protocol constraint in REST, uh, it's difficult to build efficient push-based APIs in REST. Uh, GraphQL never had that restriction to begin with. In fact, uh, real-time operations are first-class citizen in GraphQL by way of the subscription uh, operation type. So the trade-off here is, of course, that subscriptions, by being stateful, they, they add uh, a great deal more complexity to the infrastructure um, and also 
subscription support is totally optional. So that's the GraphQL superpowers. Uh, ah, sorry, let me back up. No, we are now going to talk about the GraphQL superpowers. Uh, the first is efficiency. So when you think about what happens when you make a network request to an API, uh, there are two common problems that we understand. The first is called overfetching. Overfetching is when the client makes a request and the response came back with additional data that the client didn't ask for. Relatedly, there is the concept of underfetching, and that's when the response didn't contain enough data. And the only recourse is to make another network request because you didn't get all the, da the data that you needed in the first one. Now, underfetching is especially common in REST because every time you see a hypermedia link, if you need the data in that linked document, what can you do other than to make another network request for that document, right? Uh, and in fact, the better you get at implementing the Hadios constraint, the hypermedia as the engine of application state constraint, uh, the more common underfetching becomes. And in fact, you can have underfetching and overfetching happening at the exact same time. You can issue a network request, the server responds with some JSON, and you're like, okay, that's funny. You gave me a bunch of data I didn't ask, actually ask for, but the thing that I actually do need is embedded inside this hypermedia link. So I need to go make another network request. That's pretty wasteful. And this starts to matter because if we consider a couple of common uh, network-related latencies, uh, or, or I should say, just let's just think about some common latencies for a second. If I want to read one megabyte of sequential data from a modern solid-state drive, that only takes 400 microseconds. But if I need to go to the network, let's say I need to send a packet from the US to Europe, that packet will take 150 milliseconds round trip under ideal network conditions. Now think about that for a second. 400 microseconds if we can avoid going to the network and we can read a meg, that's a lot of data. But if we need to go to the network, if I need to get even a single byte, it's gonna take at a minimum 150 milliseconds based on the speed of light. That's a huge difference. In fact, that's an order of magnitude difference of, of 400 times. That would be like the difference between getting next day shipping on your Amazon order versus next year shipping, right? Such a huge difference. And this matters a lot. You might, you might think, hey, you know, I, I have a stable internet connection, I've got broadband, but networks affect everything you do. Uh, they, they, for example, with mobile devices, uh, there are a lot of mobile devices that are even today running on networks that cap out at sub 2G level of quality. And in many parts of the world, their connections are metered and they have limited data usage allowances. Um, and even if you're, you're fortunate enough to live in a developed part of the world, uh, you can probably recall how unreliable Wi-Fi was last time you were uh, at the airport or at a conference, right? So uh, networks affect everybody and the ability to reduce network traffic, the ability to make your requests more efficient is going to play a huge role in the experience of, uh, of your users when they're interacting with your application. So the first GraphQL superpower, efficiency. It's efficient because it helps you avoid overfetching and underfetching, and we saw that in the demo. And that's because the client can declare all the data that you need in a single network request. And it has another benefit, which is that that also helps you reduce the amount of client-side logic you need. For example, if, you're, if your client needs data from two different network requests, at a minimum, it has to have some amount of logic uh, to reconcile those network requests. It has to wait for both of them to come back. What if one of them fails? Do you retry? So how do you do the client-side join? By having a single network request, you can dramatically simplify that kind of logic in the client. The second superpower of GraphQL is type safety. Through the schema, GraphQL provides type safety for your requests. And this improves predictability because clients sending the request now have a high level of confidence about the shape of the response. And this is especially useful for native clients that are written strongly typed languages or gradually typed languages 
because it enables compile time and build time type checking, which can help detect type mismatch problems early on in the development and testing feedback loop. And in particular at Facebook, uh, this allowed us to generate type safe client side models that correspond to the GraphQL queries in iOS and Android. And that allowed us to take full advantage of type safe languages like Objective-C and Java, which of course created a better developer experience, reduced the amount of bugs that could hit production, a lot of good stuff. The final superpower of GraphQL is domain modeling. And by domain modeling, I'm referring to the concept from Eric Evans' book, Domain Driven Design, that he published in 2004. Now, Eric had a really interesting idea in this book. The central idea is that people across the business, both technical and non-technical, can build a shared vocabulary called the ubiquitous language. The ubiquitous language is just natural language that's used to describe business domain entities, processes, and relationships. This kind of description in terms of natural language naturally lends itself to a graph model of nodes and relationships to other nodes. Uh, as a result, GraphQL can become a very powerful tool for building that shared language and a shared understanding of the business, um, leveraging all of the knowledge from both technical and non-technical people on your team. And what I mean is that ultimately you don't have to talk about the business in terms of, of co abstract concepts like tables and rows and joins or stored procedures, uh, you, nor do you have to talk about them in terms of resources, URIs, or HTTP operations. Uh, instead, you can just talk naturally about entities and operations. Uh, and that, that being able to talk nat more naturally means that everybody has a better understanding and you have less risk of, of building the wrong thing. Okay, that's it for the superpowers. Now let's take a closer look at authentication and authorization. Uh, Authentication and authorization are ubiquitous when it comes to APIs. Uh, so let's go over a real quick a few definitions. Authentication refers to who you are. Um, it's the, it, it relies on the, establishing the identity of the caller or the user. Um, often the client could include an access token in the request header, for example, and the first thing that the server will do is to validate the signature and the validity window of that access token. And if the uh, the token is not valid, then the server will just reject the request without going any further. And authentication requirements are usually domain agnostic. Right? Again, I mentioned two really common ways to check the validity of an access token. Uh, uh, does, it have, does it have uh, intact integrity? And then does it also have a valid uh, a validity window that, that's still fresh? Um, authorization, on the other hand, is concerned with whether or not you have permission to do what you're trying to do. Uh, for example, if we were building an event application, uh, we might have an authorization rule that says only owners can see the invite list. Uh, authorization rules are usually domain specific and therefore they belong in the business logic layer. So what does this all mean for GraphQL or any other API technology for that matter? Well, for that, I have a stack diagram that might make things a little bit more clear. So in this diagram, imagine we have an application and we, we've applied this kind of three layer architecture. Um, and at the very top, you have your transport. So you, maybe you're, you can visualize your requests from the client coming in from the top to the bottom. Uh, they come in over these two different transports, HTTP or some custom protocol over TCP. And across those two different transports, uh, they both terminate in a domain agnostic authentication layer that specifically, let's say, checks for a JWT. Um, now, when it does this, it'll say, hey, uh, if you have a JW, a valid token, a valid access token, great. Go on and talk to the REST layer, the GraphQL layer, or the RPC layer. If you don't, then I'm sorry, we're going to fail the request right here. There's no need to go further. But where should authorization logic live? Well, in this case, I assert that authorization logic needs to live in the business logic layer because authorization logic is business logic. And we don't need to debate it. We can actually just prove it by contradiction. So imagine that you uh, got really excited about GraphQL after hearing about it. You started uh, implementing it and you realized, hey, I can put these authorization checks right into the GraphQL layer, right with the resolver. What happens if you do that? Well, that's what this is gonna look like. You've got your authorization logic inside your GraphQL layer. Okay, but that's not the only way that your application, uh, your clients can access your APIs. 
there was a legacy REST API, or there's also a legacy RPC API. So what do you do? Well, you could take that authorization logic and copy paste it into the REST component, into the RPC component, but now you've taken that business critical authorization logic, which probably has security implications, and you're copy pasting that. So at a minimum, that's going to be a, uh, a coordination problem where you have to make sure that everything is shipping separately or, or hitting production at the same time. Uh, um, in the best case, um, in the worst case, you know, it can easily become a security problem. So I think uh, we definitely want to have authorization logic uh, in the business logic layer so that it can serve as a single source of truth. Another way, actually, uh, you can think about this is what if you were to test this? What if you wanted to write a unit test that validated the authorization logic? Um, if it's in the business logic layer, ideally, you should be able to isolate that without dealing with transports or API technologies or anything like that. Uh, but if it's in the GraphQL layer, then at a minimum, you're thinking about uh, writing an integration test instead of a unit test. So uh, testing is another way to kind of arrive at the right answer here. OK. Uh, that's all good. What about uh, when to use GraphQL? Um, now, this is a pretty open-ended question, so I'm going to give you a pretty open-ended response. Uh, obviously, you have to understand some of the problems that GraphQL was designed to solve. Because GraphQL, like all their tools, uh, it has costs. It's not a free lunch. Uh, at a minimum, for example, your team has to learn how to use GraphQL. And GraphQL is new. If they're used to REST, then GraphQL has a couple different ways of doing things. So rather than really getting into the nitty gritty of this, I want to give you a general way of thinking about this problem of when to use anything, any new technology. And the answer to that is uh, the design stamina hypothesis. Uh, the design stamina hypothesis was an idea proposed by Martin Fowler. Uh, and he asked this question, what's the point of good design? And the way he answered this was, well, if you start to build a piece of software and you invest no energy into design, what happens? Well, what happens is that it takes longer and longer to add the same amount of cumulative functionality. Or put another way, in order to add the same amount of cumulative functionality, you end up taking on more defects. Um, and you kind of, you, you probably have an in intuition for this. You know, if you work on a really large code base that has you know, really uh, not a lot of thought put into architecture, not a lot of thought put into organization, not a lot of test coverage, then it's kind of difficult to know how safe your change is, right? You might change something in one part of the code base and something breaks in some other part of the code base that was totally unexpected. Um, and that might cause you to slow down, to be more careful so that you're not shipping any bugs. Um, Consequently, what's the point of good design? Well, if you invest in design, if you invest in architecture, invest, invest in documentation, CI, CD, these kinds of things, then uh, you're not coding. You're not actually building the application and the functionality itself. So there's a trade-off. Well, what you're really doing, according to Martin, is that you are trying to smooth out this, the, the, the curve. You're trying to delay uh, this, this curve from flattening out so that you're any incremental functionality starts to take more and more time. That's the purpose, that's the ultimate purpose of good design. Um, and whenever you have these, these you know, dramatically oversimplified mental models, you can, uh, you can draw a line through where they intersect. And that's what Martin calls the design payoff line. And you know, when, you, when you have this design payoff line, uh, you can say, well, below the design payoff line, uh, no design wins because we never hit enough complexity to ever really get the, the returns on the investment we've made in good design. But beyond the design payoff line, you're dealing with a problem that is so complex that it's better to have invested in good design because you know at any point in there, you're, you're, there's a difference in how much cumulative functionality you can add in unit of time, and that's the payoff of good design. Um, now, Martin also warns that uh, the design payoff line is much, much lower than you probably think. In fact, he, he, I believe he thinks that uh, this is a uh, design payoff line ends up happening weeks into the project. Uh, whereas a lot of people who say, hey, we don't need good design, you know, they think it happens months or years later. Uh, that's almost always uh, uh, just technical debt. So getting GraphQL into production. Uh, here are some, some tips for taking GraphQL into production. Assuming you liked what you saw, you have some good ideas for, for what this can do for your product, for your service, for your company. Um, how do you get it into production? Well, uh, here's some things to not do. 
do not try and boil the ocean. Do not try to build the entire schema that expresses your entire business and every single workflow and every single edge case. Um, that's a lot of work and you need to have cheaper, faster ways to validate or invalidate your ideas. Relatedly, don't try to replace the REST API in one push. Chances are you have some sort of REST API or some sort of RPC API already in production, and there's no need to replace it. Uh, you should, in fact, uh, you, uh, you should prefer to uh, uh, ship a small incremental change and then you know, maybe start with an API that is um, a, a GraphQL API that is very small, very focused, and put that next to the REST API and have them both in production for a little while. Avoid putting business logic in the GraphQL layer. I mentioned in the last couple slides why you should do that. And then for dues, educate the team. Everybody needs to know why you're, why you're adopting GraphQL. What are the benefits? And how will you know whether or not you're on track for those? Pick the right server for your, uh, uh, for your stack or in your team. Uh, I mentioned that there are many different implementations across many different languages, and you don't have to use the reference implementation. Start small, build a single query, read only, no authentication required, something like a message of the day, because by the time you do that, you'll understand all of the other nuances around running a GraphQL server in production, like you know, how does your deployment work? How does clustering work? How does scaling work? How does caching work? And then you can gradually layer in features by expanding the schema one step at a time. You can add in auth, you can add in mutations, um, and you can gradually start to fill out all those business edge cases. And then if things are going really well, then you can start thinking about some advanced use cases for GraphQL. You can build an API gateway with it. You can serve both, both first party and third party traffic. You can use GraphQL for service to service communication. All of the same benefits apply there. You can use it for domain modeling. You can just use it for whiteboarding. You can say, hey, if we were to change the schema in this way, would this make sense? And it's especially useful to do this with non-technical people because they will give you feedback in a level of, hey, that, as, as a matter of just plain English, that doesn't make sense. Uh, and you might think, well, okay, can we come up with better names for this? Should this be a query instead of imitation or vice versa? You can look at persistent queries. This is an optimization that allows you to avoid sending these repetitive large GraphQL documents to the server from your client. Instead, you can store it on the server. You can take a hash of that GraphQL document, and then you can just specify that hash, and the, the server will resolve that to the document and use that uh, in its stead. And of course, subscriptions, we talked a lot about those, but relatedly, you can also use live queries and you can build out all sorts of really cool uh, real-time interactions. If you like what you saw, there's a lot more resources out there. GraphQL.org is a great uh, a gateway resource, a lot of other links to how to learn GraphQL. Uh, under GraphQL.org, we have the GraphQL community, which is a bunch of different uh, community activities that are going on. If you want to run that demo that I showed you earlier on, that's the, the repo on GitHub. And also, we love GraphQL so much here at AWS that we built an entire service around it. It's called AppSync. And if you're on AWS, you have to check out AppSync because it solves so many of those problems that I just told you about. In fact, one of the coolest things about AppSync is that it connects your mutations to subscriptions directly and it handles all of the scaling of your WebSockets and your IoT gateway, all of that, it just takes care of for you. You have to check it out. Well, I think we're a little bit over time, but I really want to thank you for uh, spending your time with me in this session. I hope you learned something. And my contact information is right here on this slide if you want to get in touch with me.